Hello, a very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. We are gathered here today for the pre-conference webinar number two on a global university and engineering education in the 21st century. So this is part of the IPERS or the International Peradena University Research Sessions 2021. So in its road to the research sessions, we are having a monthly webinar on various topics. This is organized by the International Relations Office together with the IPERS committee. The program for today is moderated by Professor J.B. Ekanayaka from the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University of Peradeniya. Professor J.B. Ekanayaka is the Chair Professor of the Electrical and Electronic Engineering of the Ministry of Peradeniya, and he is a visiting professor at the Institute of Energy at Cardiff University, UK, and an honorary professor of the School of Electrical, Computer and Telecommunication Engineering, the University of Wollongong, Australia. He has been offering courses related to renewable energy and power systems in all three institutions. For two modules offered online to MSc and MEng programs at Cardiff University, he received 100% out of 87.5 agreed for overall satisfaction and 100% overall on agreed on a series of questions around digital education as students' feedback. He is also recognized as an IEEE PES Distinguished Lecturer and he's the only Sri Lankan to hold fellowships of IEEE USA, IET UK, and IESL Sri Lanka, and join the list of 95 DLPs worldwide. So with that, I now kindly hand over the proceedings to Professor J.B. Ekanayaka. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, those who are joining from Sri Lanka. Uh, greetings for others. Uh, this is the second seminar uh, on, uh, organized by, through this uh, series of seminars. Uh, the topic today is the global university and engineering education in 21st century. Uh, thanks to pandemic, we managed to break a barrier for online education. Uh, we had, as educators, we always had uh, difficulties to go online. But today we are very happy to do our teaching learning process online. Now this has also opened up new opportunities uh, and to discuss about these new opportunities, especially about uh, possibility of uh, uh, creating a global university. Uh, we have two eminent speakers. So our uh, first speaker, is Professor Fanson. He's an Emirates Professor at KTH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology. Uh, my memory is Kumge Techniska is stolen, if I'm correct, uh, Professor Fanson uh, from Sweden. Uh, he will discuss how a global educational collaboration can help to share resources among universities of higher ranking and lower ranking. Uh, giving a brief introduction to Professor uh, Franson. Uh, he has supervised more than 30 PhD stu students uh, in KTH and contributed to many international PhD committees. He's also a visiting professor at international level, a princip principal investigator of a number of EU projects in educational sector. Uh, serving for many countries, including Sri Lanka, and a member of the various international committees in research and industrial projects. He has contributed to more than 300 research publications, including journals, conferences, and book chapters. He has been awarded the ASME Dedicated Service Award, the Swedish Engineering Academy membership, and the ASME Best Paper of the Year Award. Professor Franson, over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> that's uh, very kind of you. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen here. And I hope that you can see this in presentation format right now. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I will be talking to, to you about the global university common educational approach for engineering education in the 21st century. I have been working on these items um, for more than 25 years. And um, <clears throat> what, uh, what I've been saying that it should be done uh, related to, um, to education, uh, going online with education, what I was saying for 24 years, I was told that it could not be done. Last year, it suddenly could be done, everything. So let's see here that I'm still going to try to be a bit provocative and going one step further and talk and, and see if global collaboration will be possible. Would it be of interest for teachers? Would it be of interest for students or for someone else? Or should we just scrap and do, never ever talk about collaboration in education? Uh, my, uh, my talk here will be given on three different items, background, history, collaboration, and uh, then of course the end. Now, quality education has an impact on all of the 17 UN Sustainable Goals. We all know that, but I would give you, those of you who are not in the energy sector, I would like to give you a brief overview still um, of the situation in the world. Uh, close to 80% of the energy supply in the world will still be fossil in 2030. We have got more than 1 billion people in the world who do not have any access to electricity at all. Close to 1 billion who have only sporadic access. We use energy, is, uh, or the use of energy is largely responsible for greenhouse gas, as we know. The climate effects have to be mitigated. And we... Um, we have to look upon for the future society. We need well-educated engineers with a high attitude towards innovations, entrepreneurships, human and societal values. Education is essential. Now, where do we find and where do we need these energy engineers? Well, first of all, we, we, we need them everywhere. And the question is, how do we match the teachers and the learners? Most teachers or the most high ranked universities are situated, exaggerated slightly, of course, uh, but they're situated in the areas of the, uh, the green or the, the red circles. The most future students will be situated in the areas of the green circles. How would we be able to match this here? Well, as I mentioned, the uh, highest ranked universities, universities is one part of the world. The students are in another world. Do we go into a new educational um, uh, era? Will there be a new world for universities? Of course, university has its reason for intellectual fostering. The academic freedom is very important. And we need to avoid it that there's too much of any kind of political or industrial pressure uh, must be avoided. Um, but the freedom is under responsibility and the academics ha do have a responsibility towards society at large and present and future citizens. How do we live up to this? Well, as activity one, uh, in this talk here, I would like you to reflect upon fundamental questions regarding calibration. Uh, can we improve education? Could collaboration enhance quality? And here I'm talking about engineering. Uh, I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about anything outside uh, engineering. So please bear with me, those of you who are on the, in other uh, academic areas. Um, now, who would profit by collaboration? Would that be teachers? Which teachers? Would it be learners? Which learners? Would it be other persons, citizens and others? Uh, would it be the universities itself? And which is so in such a case? And who should make money out of the university education? I'll come back to that in a few, uh, a few seconds here also. Now, how has education changed over the years? We recall that back, back in the good old days, we had a teacher standing in the, in the front of the students. And we had some kind of material that the teacher was reading from. And we had the occasional sleeping student who was sitting in the back of the uh, of the roads there. Now that has changed to this and to this, 
over a few hundred years. And over the last year, in principle, changed somewhat to this year. I claim that we're not doing it very well, but, but still it has changed in this direction. So if we would then reflect upon collaboration in the education, we can ask ourselves, how often do we as researchers collaborate outside our own immediate boxes in research? Now, you might, you might not agree with me, of course, but I think that it's close to 100%. And um, numerous studies have shown, also shown how international co-authored research papers gain more uh, citations, have more impact, and can also attract more uh, research funding. The question is, do we collaborate because of more funding, because of citations, because of quality, or what? How often do we as teachers collaborate outside our own immediate boxes? Well, I would say close to zero percent. Do we believe, do, is the reason for that because we believe that quality will decrease if we collaborate? And if so, which quality would decrease? It decrease? Is it our teaching or the students' learning that would decrease? Or do we be, believe that there will be less funding and that someone will steal our students or whatever? So let's go into a suggestion here from, uh, from, from my side about how I think we could be working. First of all, we know very well that the formal, uh, the formal teaching that we usually do is, is only a small portion of the learning that the learners do. So in this, part, in this, um, in this picture here, we see that approximately 10% of the learning is done from the formal education, 20% is learning from others, and then the rest is done in the workplace. So we need to optimize that part and not only the part in the, um, let's see if I can make it up a nice pointer. Not, not only this part, this part here, we also need to optimize that part. Now, um, the education should be student-centered, not teacher-centered, as we saw in the picture a few minutes ago. Education should focus on learning and not on teaching. It should be self-paced anywhere, anytime, just in time, etc. And uh, it should be creativity into uh, into the education from different uh, different perspectives. Now, then you can ask yourself what will the teacher's future role be: quality versus quantity. Well, I would claim that the teacher in the in the future will become the architect to, first of all, define the overarching intended learning outcomes, define the, inter the detailed intended learning outcomes of the course or whatever we might be looking upon, create the achieved learning outcomes, that is the questions, the assessments that we should, be, that we should, um, should use towards the, uh, the students and the learners. Then there should be peer discussions between teachers and learners. And we should make the competence, that is what the teacher should be doing, make it, making the competence um, or ass assessing the competence and the skills requested from the overarching intended learning outcomes that the program, the course, or whatever you're looking at will uh, have identified. The knowledge material, the knowledge material is to a very, very large extent available outside and already. The Navier-Stokes equations that I've been writing on the blackboard for 20 years, they have been created more than 200 years ago. So why? There's nothing new in it. It's the, there's, there's new things in the explanations, of course, but that explanation can to a very large extent be found also at other places and there might not be the need for me to be talking to the students in ex cathedra way. However, what's interesting is the peer discussion between the teachers and learners. And the more time I can spend on the discussion, the better the messages might be coming out. This brings us to the flipped classroom. If the teacher is more the guide architect than in the ex cathedra, and then the ex cathedra teaching can be reduced. It can be re replaced with discussions upon the material 
which the learners then have assimilated before the discussion. Of course, we need to have some kind of diagnostic tests. They should be automatically corrected before the discussions to ensure that the learners have actually achieved the goal or have the competences and the skills to be part of an, eff uh, an efficient discussion that we, that we want to do. This would, in my opinion, give more quality time with peer discussions of uh, instead of traditional ex cathedra one way communications. There would be more, um, there would be a need for, uh, for more preparation and dis discipline by all the actors. The learners must prepare them, themselves for discussion, of course. Teachers must prepare appropriate and highly relevant questions. And these questions might, will of course need to be fully in line with the described ILOs. And that needs to be done for both the diagnostic tests and the peer discussions. Teachers should not anymore be talking about, talking about um, giving lectures of 45, 50, 55, what, 60 minutes. They should condense the most important prepar preparatory points into a few videos of five to seven minutes. Uh, in order to keep the attention span of the of the state of the um, of the learners. Now, these two are last the la last items: the preparation of the appropriate and the questions and the ILOs, as well as condensing the material, is much more difficult than one would would usually imagine. I wonder if that might be the reason why we as teachers do not do it. It is not con contrary to what, <coughs> what most of us probably believe that it is not the, the, the recordings of our own one hour lecture that is the most difficult, nor the most interesting for the, for the learners. So, if we could agree on the, uh, the, the, if we agree that high quality education material might exist out, outside our own, um, our own course, How can such material then be used and reused? Well, we're in our own organization, we're putting up a number of courses and each course consists of course of number of lectures. And at other organizations, other universities in this case here, they're doing exactly the same, the same thing. We create new courses from our organization, other organizations create new courses, but it's very, very seldom that we discuss anything related to this here. And it's extremely seldom that we do reuse any material from anyone. There are specific reasons for that. One of the reasons is of course that I, as a, as a teacher, I can never ever take over a full course from another teacher because that would not be in my, in my own interest and it would not correspond to exactly what I want to bring out to the, to the students. However, we should be able to put our material into a repository and please note that at this time here we do not talk about the courses we talk talk only about the the basic material that we put into a repository which then teachers at both organizations can reuse to create their own courses inside their own organization putting their own thoughts uh, their own ideas into it, but if you take the Navier-Stokes equations, writing the Navier-Stokes equations on the blackboard, that is enough that it's done once. However, discussing the implications of the Navier-Stokes equations with the students is something that is essential for a learning process. Okay, so what we're pro pro proposing here is a structure of learning content in a, in a repository and please note that we do not talk about courses. We talk about material, educational material. We talk about modules that we're putting together. A module is in the order of magnitude of 0 0.5 to 5 learning, learning hours, not teaching hours. And as such, it corresponds to a very large extent. It corresponds to what we would usually say that it's a, that it's a, a, a teaching, a, one teaching hour, hour would correspond to two, three, four learning hours for the students, depending upon how much assignments we do give to them. 
So the repository consists essentially of a number of modules, which are then connected into a number of lessons and then into a topic. Now, you could look upon it such that if you look upon a topic of 50 to 200 learning hours, as an estimation, you could say that the topic would correspond approximately to a course. But again, this here is about the educational material. It is not about the academic course with a specific course number, etc., at a specific university. Now, if we do work on this here in a coherent way, we get more and more teachers who do put in the modules. They, the teachers put these modules into a specific lesson, but there's nothing that says that I, as another teacher, I cannot put out a few modules here and I can put those into another lesson, combine them into another way, and then I will put my personal touch upon it. On, upon it. Now, this here is, of course, for theoretical material, but it can just as well be used for case studies, for challenges, remote labs, uh, etc. They're included in the same way, and it can be done in a very easy way. Now, if we then want to create a course out of this here, the course is outside the repository, but we can reuse the material, we can reuse a complete topic, we can reuse some of the lessons, we can re re reuse some of the modules, and we can put those into the courses that we would like to decide, and then also into the various study programs that we would like to decide as a teacher. Now, global but local versus local but global. All the material in here is based upon the Creative Commons. It means that it can be reused, it can be used, reused, and modified as per the respective settings for not-for-profit setting. So it means that you can easily go into the system, you can pick up a, a module that you would like to, and you would like to use, and you can go in and you can put out the, the part, select the parts that you would like to reuse, and then in the repository, this comes automatically back into the course that you are creating. Now, that means that the local teacher can reuse the individual modules, lesson topics, etc., as is, as is off the shelf, or can modify certain parts of it to create their own personal touch. And they can also invite the collaboration with the originator of the material. Now, if anyone would like to make a profit, well, then it's logical that you have to talk to your, the original person who has got the intellectual property rights of that, that is the originator of the, uh, of the module. Then we come to a very, very essential point. And that is that each learning resource must have an appropriate academic metadata to it. If a learning resource does not have the appropriate metadata, that is, for example, the intended learning outcomes, the assessments, the evaluation, the study certificate level, etc., it can hardly be used in an academic environment. Now, in the repository, we have put that up such that we use the European Qualification Framework and Bloom's taxonomy of knowledge, skills, responsibility, and autonomy. The assessments must be there. The assessments should be formative, automatically corrected, as these fairly easy ones, and then summative. Um, and each assessment question must, of course, clearly be related to the appropriate dialogues. The summative, uh, summative um, uh, assessments are, to a very large extent, of course, corrected manually, as we do all, uh, all do have done over the number of years. Now. Can it be possible, if we, don't, if we don't accept that there can be highly quality courses that might be created by other persons than ourselves, that is, my course is not the best, best and only best in the world, can it be possible that different teachers offer different courses within a subject area? Well, that's what we're doing all the time inside our own universities. We create a program, an, an academic program, master program, bachelor, and different teachers offer different courses. Can it be possible that education providers from different organizations can jointly offer current learning structure outside the existing universities? It's not very often done, but it can be done. And can such courses be combined into certificate and later degree? Well, our, might first our first reaction might be no. 
But if we then go take one step back and look upon the massive open online courses that exist at the present time, we have got a bunch of organizations across here, Khan Academy, Ed edX, Uda City. We've got venture capitalists, we've got non-profit world, we've got universities that are involved, and we have got companies that are involved in different, different ways. Now, these do already create something along these lines. FutureLearn, they create a micro-credential program. A micro-credential is, in this case here, on the European Qualification Framework to 6 to 7, that is the bachelor and master level degrees, uh, levels. And uh, each uh, uh, micro-credential that they produce is around 100 to 150 learning hours. And then these micro-credentials, they can be built up to different ways into a full degree. You can have certificate level one, two, three, four, five, etc. You need, of course, to have formative assessment within each level. You need to have a summative assessment before the next level, before you go to the next level. And the ILOs, again, have, in this case here, based upon Bloom's taxonomy uh, for, for each individual level. And the higher up you go in the hierarchy, the, the more you come into the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy of analyzing and creating, etc. Very, very important that you have to have the peer review. Now, peer review is um, is um, peer, peer review is an integral part of our daily life as researchers. But how often do we actually perform peer reviews in ev evaluation? Now, in this concept that we're working with here, each individual learning resource is reviewed, including the ILOs and the Bloom's taxonomy, not only the content, but also the ILOs, etc. knowledge, skills, responsibility, and autonomy. Um, but individual modules alone do not make a learning journey. How can you combine and secure proper quality? Well, if you put in such that each individual re uh, reviewed learning unit has a tag, and then that each individual journey, units are connected with each other towards a micro-credential. Of course, you have to have the formative and, and summative assessment to, to define each level with, with higher ILOs, as I mentioned previously. And you use the blockchain technology. Then you secure the authentication, uniqueness, and no copy possibility of the system. In such a case that the recipient, the student, goes into the system, they perform the assessments, they get the blockchain cert certificate, then the student goes and finds, wants to be hired by, a, uh, by an employer, gives the blockchain certificate with the, um, the appropriate information to the employer, the employer can go in and can find that this student has actually performed the different parts of a specific degree or specific certificate or whatever we should call this here. So this is then in principle what the employer usually does with the university. The employer goes to the university, looks at the transcript at that specific university. But in this particular case here, the employer goes into the blockchain certificate system and checks if the learner has actually received the, the, um, the certificates of each individual module, including the summative assessments. Now, the Explore Energy Network that we're working with here can then put together a number of teachers who are interconnected based upon the net, based upon the interest they might have someone who's working with gas turbines, someone is working with wind turbines, and they can then connect it. The same way you can do it here for the subject areas. You've got renewable energy, you have got energy business, you might have uh, energy technology of different kind, energy management, and you can easily connect all this here through a set of keywords that we're establishing. The teachers themselves, they are presented just like in any social media. They're presented and they can work together with each other. Now, the, as activity three, I would like you to identify arguments why this will not work. 
there's a few as a starting point. We can say that academic freedom will be lost. Um, it is impossible to make any automatic corrected assessment in my course because my course is the best one ever. It is impossible to perform case study challenges uh, labs online. Um, my university is highly ranked. Why should we share our educational material? Um, well, students come to my university to meet teachers in real life, not to meet teachers online. Um, why should other teachers be able to create programs out of my material and profit from it? There's a bunch of reasons why this should not work. Um, of course, it would also be interesting to find out if it would ever be able to work at all. So thank you for your attention. And uh, in the discussion later on, I would be extremely pleased to hear your comments about why this will never work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Panson, for that inspirative talk. Uh, in fact, uh, he introduced uh, uh, in an innovative, yet maybe uh, debatable way of uh, creating a global university. And we would like to hear from you all, your comments, your questions, and so on. So only way to uh, pass questions to Professor Fanson and uh, our next speech speaker is through the chat box in uh, Zoom. So please post your questions through the chat box. We will, uh, you know, gather all the questions at the end of the webinar, which is after the second uh, speech, uh, and uh, we will then uh, direct those questions to the two speakers. So, uh, you know, while, while we are talking about a global university which can uh, produce new courses in innovative ways, we also need to make sure that we capture the, the national needs. The, every country has its own expectation from an engineering uh, degree program. To talk about that, we have the, the, the best person in the country that is Professor Sarat Abekong, a senior professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Peradeniya. He will be talking about engineering education in general and the separation of roles, responsibilities, and competencies of engineers, particularly looking at the Sri Lankan perspective. Professor Abekong was a former dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the former vice chancellor of the University of Peradeniya. He has uh, received his BSc degree from Peradeniya, then moved to University of British Columbia for his PhD and MSc degrees. Uh, he served at many senior administrative positions and has led and served many local and international institutions as the president, chairperson, member, and a founder. In particularly, he was the founder chairman of the Engineering Council of Sri Lanka, and also the, the president of the Institute of Engineers of Sri Lanka. He's also a recipient of a number of uh, prestigious awards, from international bodies, including the World Educational Congress and CMO Asia for recognizing his services to the higher education sector. So let me invite Professor Sarat Abekong to deliver his uh, thoughts about engineering education, Sri Lankan context. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ikanayaka, for the introduction. Uh, 
from uh, the topic that uh, I'm going to make my presentation on is engineering education uh, Sri Lankan context uh, and I hope uh, all of you can see that. Uh, let me uh, first thank the organizers for inviting me for this uh, presentation. Um, I would be uh, talking about uh, some issues in engineering education in general, uh, starting with uh, what engineering is and uh, how the education should be designed. And then uh, I will uh, talk about a few challenges that we have currently in engineering education globally. And then I will uh, move on to some of the issues that we face uh, in Sri Lanka in the area of uh, engineering education and professional practice. Um, of course, uh, the meaning of engineering or what engineering is about is basically finding out the people's needs and developing ideas to address the needs and seeing how it can be made so that it is affordable. These are the fundamentals of what engineering is all about. Um, when you talk about uh, people's needs, I want to go back a little bit in time, not a little bit actually, uh, uh, quite a bit in time, to uh, the times of early human. The early human uh, had the basic needs uh, as we have now, basically water, food, and shelter. Uh, were the basic uh, needs uh, now as well as then. So, but however, his uh, whole time was uh, used to finding those needs. So, very, uh, early human was very hard working and there was absolutely no time to do anything other than uh, looking for food uh, mostly and life has always been that way and it continues to be that Then uh, better tools were designed and produced than what uh, they were using. One of the earliest tools that uh, come under this, this category is the plow and uh, production of uh, better tools allowed one person to produce more food than his family needs. Therefore, he was able to share his food with his neighbor. This freed the neighbor from looking for food all the time. So that person had uh, some time to think. So this thinking, Thinking time is basically the emerging of engineering. So when people have time to think, and when they think properly, engineering emerged. So uh, once engineering has emerged, more inventions followed. Water supply systems were designed so that it was not necessary for ladies to walk long distances every day, sometimes twice a day to get their water. And having time to think, led to a better and efficient life and to have more creations. Sports, music, taking care of the sick, etc. This is what we call civilization. So it is very clear that engineering and civilization are synonymous. We need to understand this very clearly before we go on to talk about engineering education in mind. So when you look at what engineering education is in, in, the, in the definition, when you define engineering education, you can find so many definitions everywhere. So the, basically the activity of teaching knowledge and principles related to the professional practice of engineering is uh, probably one of the best definitions that we can get. So engineering education therefore is focused at improving the quality and diversity of engineering graduates entering the technical workforce. However, as I explained earlier, since engineering is synonymous with civilization, engineering education must also focus on this civilization aspect. So whenever we design the engineering programs, we have to think about this so that engineering programs should take civilization forward and not backward. The great uh, Mahatma Gandhi was once asked by a journalist, what do you think about uh, Western civilization? 
His reply was, it's not a bad idea. So what it really means is that in the, in the name of civilization, we have actually gone back in some area. So this is indeed uh, something that we really want to think about when we talk about engineering. And then it is uh, not only uh, academic material that we teach the students in the universities that matter, professional practice. Engineers, engineering is a profession, like other professions of uh, other professions like medicine, architecture, accountancy, and so on. So when it is a profession, the professional practice also should come into the picture. The professional practice is conduct and work of someone from a particular profession. So this professional practice is generally uh, governed by various professional organizations. So these uh, respective professional bodies set standards of ethics, performance, competence, even insurance and training, etc. That must be met to remain within the profession and they are regularly checked and improved. So professional practice is something uh, dynamic and it will change. So we have to prepare our students to face these challenges as well. When you talk about challenges, the current challenges in engineering education, I just noted four of them here. Uh, Professor Franson discussed uh, some of these things in his uh, presentation, but uh, I thought I'll talk about uh, these four in particular. Uh, in designing the engineering education for the future, computing and engineering, and calls for professional and non-technical skills, approaches to developing new skills, and strengthening the assessment process. When you talk about computing and engineering, we all know that engineering and computing increasingly intersect in both the education and career pathways. So it is clear that the use of computing skills is increasingly fundamental to almost all engineering fields and their applications. So the computing literacy and the ability to use computing tools for design and engineering work have become a necessity for engineering practice. So we have to pay special attention to this increasing intersection of computing and engineering, and we have to uh, adapt to these changes in engineering education programs. And then uh, professional and non-technical skills Employers demand for strong professional skills as a necessary complement to strong technical skills is intensified. Employers are asking more and more things from us uh, to be uh, to cultivate in our students. So engineering educators, therefore, will have to play a central role in the development and continuous updating of the skills that are required by the profession. So when you Talk about these skills in addition to more traditional professional skills like oral and written communication and teamwork, etc., which have been there for some time. Now, employees are looking for engineers with uh, creativity, leadership, entrepreneurial skills, lifelong learning skills, and the ability to work in interdisciplinary teams and to incorporate interdisciplinary knowledge in their work. When you talk about interdisciplinary teams and knowledge, it is uh, going outside the core of engineering. However, I don't, I'm not sure whether we are actually doing it in the right direction because uh, when I entered the university uh, about 45 to 50 years back, we had a two year common course in engineering. At least the engineering sections, everything was taught to us and the two years of specialization afterwards. But now we have gone to a system where we have only one semester common and rest of it is specializing even inside engineering. But when you talk about disciplinary teams, it's not only inside engineering, it is beyond engineering. So these are areas that we, we have to probably think back and see whether what we are doing is okay. And globally, engineering institutions and councils as well as educators are responding as uh, Professor France and very clearly explained to us, just responding to workplace demands and some progress has been made 
Although the progress has been made, some concerns persist because we have not gone into analyze how this progress actually is are working to develop the professional skills that we really really want uh, like on a long time basis. So these are largely ad hoc and the mechanisms for closing the loop are yet to be developed. Uh, when we come to approaches to developing new skills, that is the third point that I'm going to talk about. The adoption of active learning, that is uh, learning by doing uh, approaches is accelerating across the globe. Uh, so research has demonstrated that the effectiveness of active learning techniques, uh, they improve student engagement and learning as well as decreasing achievement gaps for students from diverse backgrounds. We all know that when we have a group of students entering the first year in engineering, they come from diverse backgrounds and our aim is to uh, make them, take them up to the same level. Uh, so, all, but however, we find a lot of gaps and these gaps can be, achievement gaps can be decreased and it has been proven uh, by this active learning process, process that are currently being experimented. And in addition, experiential learning both in and out of the classroom, such as through internships, core programs, service learning, and study in other countries, study abroad, can help students develop non-technical professional skills. Especially this studying abroad or studying away from your own area definitely enhance language proficiency and also intercultural aptitude, which is ex an extremely important uh, uh, thing for engineering, in practicing engineers to go on and meet so many different types of people. In the same uh, area approaches to developing new skills, one of the biggest areas now that we have to tackle in engineering education is uh, entrepreneurship programs. Just more and more students are now going on to develop their own, uh, own business establishments and they become entrepreneurs, which is very good. They start so many startup uh, projects. So this is, must be in, cultivated in the university. So this will translate well into a variety of uh, careers. However, however, the fundamental thing that we have to keep in mind is that whatever we do, some critical engineering skills are best gained when they are explicitly taught in the classroom. So we cannot completely take away the classroom. Whatever we do, if we do other things cannot take away the classroom, at least we have to identify what are the things that we must teach in the classroom rather than implicitly through other experience. One other thing that I would like to touch upon in approaches to developing new skills is the lifelong learning. Lifelong learning is a practice we have to cultivate among our students so that they will be able to grasp rapid scientific and technological advances and the growing breadth of technical and professional capabilities that are becoming more and more today. Every day things change. So lifelong learning is something that has to be cultivated during undergraduate period at the universities. So engineering faculties must be trained on new teaching and learning techniques, as well as new technology and essential professional skills. As Professor Ekanayaka mentioned uh, at the beginning, because of COVID-19, uh, we got, a, got an opportunity to try some of these new techniques. And we know that some things work and some things so. So, but we have to keep on trying and learning new techniques and, uh, and also essential professional skills. To do that, uh, we also need the faculty with the experience as working engineers. Now, to this end, uh, the, the current uh, semester system is actually helpful. If we can actually run these semester systems properly and systematically, each semester, if each semester can be completed in 20 weeks, including examinations and holidays. So for the two semesters, you will spend 40 weeks and there'll be 12 weeks left in the calendar year. That 12 weeks can be used for the teachers to get 
practical experience in the projects as working engineers. Then they can come and share those experiences with the students. We must do that unless we go there, go to the practice of the grain there, the engineering teaching will not be complete. And also, if we can synchronize our semesters, Sri Lankan semesters with those of uh, other countries, the, the thing that I was talking about a few minutes back, that is student exchanges and work practicing uh, in other classrooms in other countries can be done. So these are the areas uh, to which we have to focus our future plan. When it comes to assessments, efforts to implement and assess educational change can be strengthened with better tools of assessment, which are so many things that are coming up now. Even the traditional assessment methods can be redesigned. And also we should expect uh, the, their effect, long-term effects on individuals and also on uh, the faculty members, departments, colleges and institutions. So that has to be these uh, complete uh, ongoing process should be, you have to keep assessing them and improve them. Right, now we come to uh, engineering practitioner, practitioners. Uh, engineering is uh, not only a pro profession that is practice, practiced by graduate engineer. To, to make a project complete in the proper manner, we need graduate engineers, we also need engineering technologists and engineering technicians. So basically these three basic groups get together and then develop a project that will help human beings to live a better life. So uh, when you have these different types of practitioners, uh, the, there are global codes uh, that come under international engineering plans where uh, they have come up with certain standard uh, sets of uh, assessing or, or grading people. So for Washington, Washington Accord that uh, talks about engineering programs of four year duration. What are the things that we need in that basic minimum needs are discussed in Washington Accord. And then there's Sydney Accord, which discusses engineering technology programs of three year duration. So the Sydney Accord sets the standards for engineering technology program. And then there is Dublin Accord for engineering technician programs, which are of two year duration. Since uh, the graduate engineers to work together with engineering technologists and technicians, we at the universities also should know these things, how our graduates will work when they uh, go after their completing their degree in the university. So when you look at Sri Lankan context, there are four faculties of engineering conduct four-year degree programs, then technology faculties, technical and technological colleges, etc., conduct other degree and diploma programs in the country. And uh, for recognition and accreditation of all these programs is carried out by engineering institutions together with respective uh, global bodies. Uh, like engineering alliance. And uh, the professional practice is uh, regulated by Engineering Council Sri Lanka. Engineering Council Sri Lanka was established uh, only in 2017. The practicing engineers and educators in this country have been pushing to establish this for over 20 years. And finally, it was established. It was established four years back on 10th of March 2017 by a parliamentary act. The act states that no engineering practitioner shall engage in the practice of engineering profession unless such engineering practitioner is registered with the engineering council. So, if you practice engineering without registering, then it is an offence, and it is extremely serious. The person who commits such an offence shall, on conviction after summary trial before a magistrate, be liable to imprisonment for a period not exceeding one year or to a fine not exceeding 100,000 rupees or both. So you cannot practice engineering unless you become a member of the Engineering Council of Sri Lanka. Now, when you come to Engineering Council member categories, there are six categories of engineering practitioners uh, identified by this act. 
chartered engineer, associate engineer, affiliate engineer, incorporated engineer, engineering diploma, and engineering technician. So we have to know about these things. The top five group here, chartered engineers, associate engineers, affiliate engineers, incorporated engineering diplomats, to become member of engineering council, they must have the membership or recognition by two bodies, that is Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka or Institution of Incorporated Engineers Sri Lanka. It's required for this first five categories. For the last one, the engineering technicians, in addition to recognition by Tertiary and Vocational Education Commission of Sri Lanka, that provides uh, another part as well. So it is not very clearly established. So qualifications are to become a chartered engineer, membership of institution of engineers is mandatory. To become an incorporated engineer, membership of institution of incorporated engineers is mandatory. To become an associate engineer or an affiliate engineer, recognition of a four year and three year respective degree programs by the institution of engineers Sri Lanka is required. And to become an engineering diploma, recognition of a respective diploma by IISL is mandatory. Right, if, you, if I look at these uh, two engineering institutions, Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka and Institution of Engineering Sri Lanka, they are, they are the same corporate members and non corporate members, mainly members and fellows are similar, but these two categories have two different uh, education and uh, professional experience qualifications to become a member or a fellow or under the fellow and all that. Current scenario in the country is engineering council Sri Lanka looks after all engineering practitioners, six types again. So it is important to clearly identify a set of education and other requirements for each category of membership. So engineering council has embarked on developing a comprehensive set of uh, competencies, roles, and responsibilities for each of the six categories of engineering practitioners. What are the competencies, roles, and responsibilities to become a charter engineer? What are those for to become an incorporated engineer? This has not been spelled out. And there are so many uh, overlapping areas. So now the ECSL has impact on developing them. In the process, there are so many issues that have come into the picture. First one is these engineering institutes, professional bodies, and this tertiary and vocational education commission, and engineering council should be on one page in understanding all these uh, categorizing of engineering practice. And then they should also agree on education and experience requirements for different categories within and across professional bodies. We have a huge problem uh, coming in in a few days' time. That is the plight of technology graduates who will look over within, within days. I think there are about 1,000 uh, graduates will be out in no time. And uh, none of us have any view on what they will do and how will they practice. So therefore, Engineering Council has the responsibility of gazetting some of the decisions as quickly as so current and urgent need therefore is an in-depth study of the issues by universities because our graduates will be practicing in the field, professional associations and engineering council and practitioner categories. And also this should focus on arriving at clearly defined educational and other requirements and also clear agreements on competencies, roles and responsibilities for these different categories of engineering practice. And more than all this, it is extremely important that the general public is made aware of these issues, findings and conclusions. The general public is largely unaware of. They do not know when somebody goes through a technology degree or engineering degree or engineering corporate degree, where will they end up? And what kind of practices they will do? And what are the possible uh, employment opportunities? This is this area is totally blank for the general public. However, it is extremely important to educate not only our students but also the general public. 
Therefore, at universities, we should take the lead as we are duty bound to make sure that funds provided by every citizen of Sri Lanka in maintaining state universities are used for the benefit of the country. So at universities, we have to take the lead in clearing some of the issues that I have mentioned in, in case of Sri Lanka, and also in general in improving the quality of engineering education in the future. That ends my presentation. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining in for this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abedkom, for that uh, shedding some lights about uh, what is uh, what will happen in the future and what is expected as an engineer. Uh, so there are some questions from the audience. Uh, before I move on to the questions from the audience, let me take the liberty to uh, ask from Professor Franson. Uh, in the innovative model that you describe, how do you incorporate some of the attributes and skills that Rosa Bacon was uh, mentioning? If you could uh, briefly touch yes. upon that question, please. Uh, let's see here. The, uh... Uh, could I, if I understand it correctly, the question it was about uh, the um, the skills of the future engineer, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, if you look upon this here, there is, for example, we have got um, a, a lesson on twenty first century skills, where there is a, a teacher who who develops the, the thoughts about how you should be, how you should behaving, etc. And then in the challenges, the students, they will have to do their work and they will have to present their pitches towards the, um, uh, towards the teachers who are evaluating the material. There's also a peer review system that, uh, that we work with in the, between the students in the sense that they then have to re review the material from the others. Of course, the, all that part of this can be done remotely. Uh, no, what to say, part of this can be done uh, automatically corrected, whereas there is definitely a, uh, a need for the direct contact between both the, the students and between themselves, as well as the um, as well as the uh, between the, the the student and the teacher, I don't know. Does that give you? Does that answer your question? I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh... Uh, because the computer is not closer to me, so somebody has to unmute it. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Toast, uh, Franson, uh, for that answer. Uh, there were a couple of questions hanging around in the chat box where to those you have already uh, you know, written your uh, comments, but for the, uh, for the benefit of the wider audience, let me repeat the question so that you can you know, give the answer to them verbally. Uh, the one question is the assessment methods and quantitative expansion of skilled graduates and postgraduate mutually exclusive. Can educational institutions manage this trade-off between quality and quantity in the pressure, pressurized environment and competition? Over to you, Professor. You are muted now. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yes, I think it can be done uh, based upon many different issues. But it, um, I would even go as far as, as stating that we would not really need to have 
a formal assessment of the learners at the university. Because at the present time, if we, we do have quite, a, we have had over the years, quite a few number of, um, of applicants from Sri Lanka to KTH. Many of these applicants, they have been highly qualified in the Sri Lankan system, but they have not, but the Sri Lanka universities have not been highly ranked in Europe. As such, the students have not been able to pass the administrative hurdle of the application process. However, if we instead would have had a list of admission questions to the students, then I'm sure that there would have been a much higher success rate among the Sri Lankan students because they could actually prove that although they do not have a bachelor, for example, from a university like the MIT or, uh, or Stanford or something like that, they have got more skills, more competence, and they know more than the students who apply from MIT or Stanford. So I do believe that this is, this is highly possible that we can be doing this, this kind of things. And also with the ILOs, the, uh, I got many examples. Um, well, if, if you take the example of a car, if you're going to, to take the driver's license, you need a car. If you're going to be a technician working on the car, you need the same car. But the intended learning outcomes are completely different. But it's the same object that you're working with. So in my opinion, we can definitely have both vocational training, certificate training, as well as bachelor or master training with the same kind of, with, in many cases, with the same kind of material, although we have to have in, in different intended learning outcomes. Over. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Franz. This uh, question is to Professor Salata uh, the, 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 the question is about global engineering technology education. A small description is given about uh, global engineering technology education. It says less rigorous calculus requirements, but more hands-on aspect of engineering. Some of the uh, things you mentioned, experiential learning, etc., with less theoretical background. And uh, the, 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 the question is, many countries uh, uh, have set path for such graduates to become fully fledged practicing engineers. These are the global engineering and technology education, uh, the, the graduates who have followed global engineering and technology education. So the question is, what is the status on this in Sri Lanka? Uh, right, thank you. Um, in Sri Lanka, currently the Sri Lankan universities uh, are continuously uh, embarking on changing their delivery modes as well as uh, changing the curriculum. So we have uh, new uh, quality assurance uh, programs, quality assurance sales established in universities. So all these new techniques are being uh, discussed and uh, regular changes are being proposed. And hopefully uh, we will go with uh, the world in these uh, changes in the future. So that is uh, the standard as, it, as of now. And the universities are aware that these changes are needed and uh, things are happening in these directions. And even the setting up of question papers, answers, looking at uh, intended learning outcomes, and all, all those things are currently happening here. Hopefully, so we will be with the rest of the world uh, sooner than later. Thank you. There's another question. This is uh, for the both panelists. Uh, Washington Accord called for outcome based evaluation. It looks not only at the attributes of the graduate uh, engineers, but also on how the engineering programs are designed and executed by offering universities to take the students from 
where they are to the level called by the expected attributes. Are we going backwards in Sri Lanka by focusing more on input standardization rather than the outcome attributes? Let me first uh, get uh, Professor Abepon's view about uh, this. I agree with you to a certain extent on this so-called input standardization. Yes, we should have a better way of uh, taking students to the university than the standardization practices that are followed in the country. Uh, uh, however, uh, I don't see any, any, any positive change in the, in the near future, although the university uh, academics uh, have identified those changes are required and we keep trying to persuade the authorities to do changes necessary. Yes, standardization is definitely not a good way of achieving what we really want to achieve. I agree. Thanks. Uh, uh, let me uh, put the same question to Professor Franson. In global post uh, perspective, would you be able to shed some lights on this particular question? You want me to read the question again, or you are? You no, no, I've got, I've got it here. Yeah. Uh, the, um, I think that the, the uh, as you as I was pointing out a few minutes ago, there, I think that the the input, if if you got a good input, you're going to have a good output. But on the other hand, if we're just going to look upon the qualifications, the the, the paper qualifications of a, a person coming from a specific university, then we are, we are not looking at it from the, uh, from the right perspective. I think that if we, if we put up the, if we do our prepar preparatory work in such a way that we can give the learners bridging material that they actually will be able to, to look upon and they will learn with their own pace, with their own, in their own time, then the learners will be able to qualify for coming into the um, coming into the system, and then it will you will automatically be able to look for the output. So, um, if if you're going to stay with um, with the, the uh, well, to a certain extent, that the administrators are deciding upon who will enter the university, then yes, you're going in the wrong direction. Over. Okay, thank you. So there is one, one more question. Uh, this is again, you have uh, Professor Franson has given answer online, uh, but uh, for the benefit of uh, the reader, the, the audience, let me read that question. Teachers didn't like to share their own materials with others. Is there a way to change the mind? It's a difficult question for you, Professor. Well, um, yes, I know that we do not want to, we're, we're not willing to share uh, very often. And, but I think that the, the, it is not a question of not sharing individual pieces of the material. I think it's really a question of, of having that uh, we do not want to share the whole course with someone else. Uh, and I do not know if that means that we are, are um, that we do not want to get the reviews done. We are afraid of the reviews. We are afraid of the fact that we are that uh, the uh, our course is not as good as um, as a course at another place. That that's probably a large uh, large reason I would guess. But if we can start sharing the individual material, as for saying for example that. If I'm doing a complete course on power generation, I'm not very good in certain aspects of that uh, of that part of the of power generation. But I'm I'm very good in two or three small pieces. Now, if I then produce these two or three small pieces and I share those, then I can reuse two or three good pieces from other colleagues also. So I think that the there there are certain. The, First of all, we do not want to share our whole courses. We never take over a full course from someone else, but we're not uh, afraid of stealing. 
from our colleagues to students. If the students were doing it, we, we would call it plagiarism and they would, uh, they would not pass. But when we are doing it, it's just that we're reusing the material from someone else. So, so if, we, if we start doing it in small pieces, then I think that, it will, uh, that then it will work. And we have not so far, apart from this uh, repository that I'm, uh, I'm looking at here, we have not so far had the possibility to share the material in small bits and pieces because it has not been, there has not been a framework for it. And I think that the framework can be done now with all the material that can be available and it's available. And the reason why the material on YouTube is not used is because there's no intended learning outcomes and there's no assessments, etc. So you cannot really use it in a, in a very good way. Over. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question uh, for probably, it's, it's probably for me because I am the one who is teaching me a 761 undergraduate. So let me take that question. Do engineering graduates in Sri Lanka get experience in design after their graduation? For example, designing a power distribution system according to BS7671. I mean, the one difference between the engineering education and in medical or somewhere, after graduation, they have to be uh, uh, intern period. Uh, that during that uh, intern period, of course, they have been trained under a more uh, experienced uh, you know, the medical practitioner. So they will have, uh, you know, kind of uh, apply what they learn in, uh, in their degree program in more uh, you know, structured manner. For in our case, of course, this is, this is not happening, especially with the, uh, with the competitive job markets, the, the, the companies wanted our engineers to straight away come and do the jobs. So sometimes you may not get that kind of training un until you start your charter, you know, the, the training for your charter. Uh, so, uh, so you know, like whatever you learn in the uh, in your classroom may not be uh, fully used uh, afterward, but they are useful as background knowledge for any job that you will be doing. So. I cannot really tell that you will have, uh, you know, the direct application of what you have learned, but they are, they will be definitely useful. Uh, okay, there is uh, one last question I'm going to take for the, uh, considering the, uh, the time limitations we have. Uh, this is from the same, uh, person who put up a question before, uh, since the technical content to teach in every engineering discipline has multiplied over the few decades, while demand for non-engineering contents and other skills to be imparted has become very strong from the industry, why the engineering educators should not consider increasing the duration of engineering program to five years, unless other professional degrees like medicine, which started with three years and has increased to five years, engineering remains four years since the beginning. Uh, so uh, I, I probably will, uh, I mean, I, I know that uh, uh, there are three-year degree program also in certain countries, uh, but let me ask from Professor Panson what his views about increase in the, degree pro uh, the duration of degree programs, particularly the engineering degree program. Well, I would I would say that um, if you look upon the the evaluation that I was talking about previously, the stackable concept where you go stepwise, um, I think that you should have the, um, the possibility of, um, of getting in 
to a certain a certain level and thereafter you should be able to continue on that level or no continue to another level so having the engineering programs of three or four or five years i would rather say that you should have a, a, a program in which there is an exit exit after after one year there's an exit after two years there's an exit after three there's an exit after four and there's an exit after five so um now in sweden they've got the, we've got the, the five-year pro program which is three plus two in the sense that um that you can you you do get the engineering degree after three years and then you can you can have a one-year master thereafter or a two-year master there thereafter so it's three four or five and putting ourselves in, in today's environment with the lifelong learning that we're looking upon, with our interest of having students going back and forth between life, re, real life experience and universities, I do not think that we should have a, a full five-year program, which is either you take this or, I, or, or not. And if, if you look upon it in, in the sense that, um, a dropout, a person who drops out after two years from a program can be looked upon as a dropout or they can be looked upon as a positive success for two years. So I, 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 would, I would not suggest that you go directly towards a three or, four, three or four or five year program. I would suggest that you carefully look upon what is needed, what kind of uh, need is there in the country? Do you have a need for one year, two year, three year, four year, and five year? And that will be different, different persons for different or different. Uh, uh, well, you should have different cer cer certificates. You should have certificate programs as well as, as full bachelor, bachelors and masters. Over. Thank you very much, Professor Franzen. Uh, I'm going to take the very last question and I'm, I'm going to direct it to Professor Saratta Begum. Could you let us know your views on 4 plus 1 program, which is master's by five-year program? Maybe you can combine with the previous questions. And <laughs> Yeah, for the previous question, I fully endorse what Professor Pansen mentioned. And if you talk about uh, Sri Lankan context, uh, the four-year program that we offer is actually more than four years uh, in terms of credit pay. We usually take uh, 30 credits per year is the normal calculation of uh, academic programs in the country. And the engineering programs that are offered in Sri Lanka State University are 150 credits. So that is already, you can consider is a five-year content compressed into four. So, uh, yes, uh, so that is happening. And but as uh, Professor Franzen said, that I also explained, there are so many levels of engineering practitioners. So, you can have uh, exit points at various phases, and the whole program can be redesigned. Then, uh, Professor Shamin Jinadas's question on could you let us know your views on 4 plus 1 program? I think it's a good thing, which is master's by 5 year program, it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing. And uh, we should actually end up and where the fourth year optional courses should be designed so that people can uh, go through them and design and prepare for the master's program at the end of the end of three years uh, by taking that the optional courses appropriate. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Sarat, for that. So, uh, we are uh, right at the end of the program. So, uh, let me conclude this session by uh, acknowledging Professor Torsten Franson from KTH and uh, Senior Professor Salat Abekon from the uh, civil engineering department, uh, who has uh, given very uh, innovative ideas uh, for you to take home and think about to create a new ways of delivering our engineering programs uh, which suit for 21st century. 
I saw a comment in Facebook. Somebody was uh, commenting that none of the speakers are from 21st century, but I'm sure you, that uh, comment will uh, not be any longer in your mind because they have shed their lights in the right directions. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the two speakers. Uh, and also let me thank all the participants who spent one and a half hours with us. Uh, uh, you know, listening to the two speakers and uh, posting our, our questions, and uh, thank for the for the organizers. They are well organized. Man, you know, we were not expecting this kind of organization. So thank you very much for the team from INRC and the IPER Secretariat for uh, organizing such a wonderful event. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.